thief! Criminal! Hello and welcome back to Frank's Penance. I'm just checking out my safe house and hey. Paul Ferenc sitting around hey, to see what he wants. I'm in no rush, man. I can hang back if you want, you know. In case you need some help, I'm just saying. We're located. Anyway, I know you're the guy that brings it back alive. Am I right? That last thing with you and Flora. You're a crazy bastard. <laughs> well, he's right about that. So he's just going to now sit in this safe house. I guess this is technically his safe house. But I need you to sleep because I wanted to move time for it a little bit. So I'm just going to have a quick nap. It's uh, half two in the morning right now. I wanted to go into town once it was a little bit lighter because I'm tired of walking around in the dark. It's a horrible day. But at least it's a bit lighter now. And Paul's actually still here. He just sat there for like three hours and watched me sleep. So I guess that makes him a good buddy. I don't know. So I'm going to head to Mike's Bar and to Parlour to look for more activities to do on this horrible rainy day. Day one of my new job as a police informant. Swept 200 square meters of floors and made an uncountable number of cups of coffee. I was the new police maid, fresh out of a maximum security prison. But at least I had some form of freedom. And if I really wanted to, I could have gone back home to visit my family. But as you might have guessed, I didn't. Right after I got out, I found news waiting for me that the prison officers had conveniently misplaced. That my father had died of his long-term illness. I suspect Pat had a hand in keeping the information from me, probably out of consideration for my fragile mental state. No idea if he made the right choice there. But anyway, the news quenched my thirst for family interaction pretty well, mainly because it made me feel guilty as fuck for essentially abandoning them. I didn't have the emotional intelligence to deal with it, so I went back to ignoring them altogether. Being in that busy Belfast police station gave me a chance to observe how they were organised, a topic I took perverse interest in mainly to see if it confirmed to my own ideals of organisation and to compare it to the IRA. I was glad to see that they were, in general, more professional, although a lot of the professionalism was on paper only. But at least there was paper, accountability, strategy, an attempt to control the inner chaos of their ranks. I was seeing a part of my own vision for a well-oiled machine, getting stuff done, knowing who did what, and dealing out the rewards proportionately. So I've made it to Mike's bar. Let's see if any of my buddies have anything interesting for me to do. First, I wanted to see if Flora had anything. She was hanging out here. She only had pleasantries. It seemed there was no missions from her available at the moment. So instead, I'm going to go over to the guy whose name I still don't know. And he did have a mission for me. You ever heard of cat? It's this leaf, like tobacco, but better. It's coffee and pot put together. Dudes in the desert live on it. It's awesome. They're growing it out in the greenhouses. I was thinking, we should get some of that shiznit. They got a whole sack of it sitting right out in the open between two greenhouses. You want to try and get it? So basically, he just wants me to get him some recreational drugs. Not exactly the sort of thing Frank wants to spend his time doing. So we're going to head to Parla instead to see if the factions have anything better to do. Towards the end of my first week as a professional drinks machine, I was introduced to the inspector who was going to supervise me as an informant. He was tall, wore a well-tailored suit with clean, short hair, and put on a false mask of friendliness from the get-go. Basically, this guy was my opposite. Perfect. His name was Anthony, or Tony as he so insisted. He was a pretty experienced investigator, yet still seemed innocent and trusting in a way that suggested he'd never investigated anything interesting. He proceeded to talk to me about his whole plan. I sat and looked alternately between him and the floor and the off-color ceiling light. Since I got out of prison, I've been a whole lot more reserved than I've been on the inside, Probably because my brain was trying to process the strange feeling of gratitude I had towards the system that I wanted to destroy. So now we're in Parla. I'm heading to the UFLL building because it says there's something for me to do there. So let's see what the door guard has to say. Uh, hang on. Hey man, come have a chat. The Kumba's busy. But I did hear about the situation. I'm supposed to find someone to go to the cockfighting arena. The APR has some foreigner locked up there. Might be you can cash in on what he knows. Maybe. So it sounds like there's another expat being held by the APR in this cockfighting ring. 
So it looks like I'm supposed to go over there and free him. And that's going to be my mission for the UFLL. So pretty easy and pretty much in my interest. Let's go over there and get it done. The sting itself was on a loan shark ring that was using its illegally obtained profits to prop up IRA cells all over the country. Hearing about it made Fergal's ability to get dodgy vehicles at the drop of a hat make more sense. It was less of a big deal than I had expected, or even hoped. I had assumed I was going to be put back into the IRA cell and told to shoot them all in the head. But I was getting the impression that the police weren't all that enthusiastic about shooting people, which at the time I thought was both strange and weak of them. Instead, I was going to take me out some loans, probably not pay them back, then try and see who the most important members of their ring were while trying not to get kneecapped by them. I didn't really see the details of how it would work, but Tony had a file full of papers to explain everything. It took all the reading skills I'd built up in prison to get through even the first paragraph of page one. The ideal outcome, though, was for me to become a part of the ring itself. Tony explained that part to me on day one because he wanted to bash some honesty into me. As you might imagine, he thought that if I was getting in on the deal with the Sharks, I might be tempted to stay, or even worse, become a double agent. So he stood before me, telling me to play nice and be good, but he wasn't exactly offering any lollipops in return. In fact, there was pretty much nothing other than my old zombified sense of morality to really keep me on the right side of the fence. And when you consider that I would soon be handling sums of money the likes of which I'd never come close to even seeing, the fact they didn't handcuff me to Tony the whole time shows an obscene amount of trust in this not technically a murderer. So I'm now nearing the site where this guy is being held up. I know just there's this little pathway that comes onto a raised section beside all the buildings. So I thought I might be able to get a nice view over the area to locate some of the enemies and possibly snipe some guys from up here as well. It's a pretty misty day, so it seems less likely I'd be spotted up here. So it's a pretty good day for some scouting. I can see some armed emplacements in the distance, but at the moment I can't actually see any enemies. I was expecting to see guys just wandering around out there. Perhaps they're all inside the building since it's raining. That would make some level of sense. I can spot something out there because my little uh, monocular reticule goes green when you look at something of interest. So there's definitely some weapons or an emplaced position uh, directly in front of me. But since the coast looks pretty clear, I decided I'll just start sneaking my way in. Perhaps I'll see some of the enemies once I get closer. So I'm going to come over to these old rickety market stalls. As I approach, I spot a guy uh, on a mounted gun through this car window. I'm going to spy him out. I thought I can probably take him out using my silenced pistol and remain undetected. So I stand to try and get a shot at him. That, of course, ruins my stealth. He notices something and starts walking towards me. So now I'm going to hide in the corner here and hope he doesn't actually come over here. So I want to try and take him out without anyone else knowing that I'm here. Because I can probably get further into the complex before I'm discovered. That's going to help me take out more guys without having to risk a giant firefight where I could quite easily be surrounded. So I don't know where this guy is. I'm listening out to hear him say things because conveniently the AI guards always talk to themselves as they're walking around. It seems he didn't know that I was behind this little thing. He was just looking at the ground <laughs> just around the corner. So I poked my head around, shot him a few times. He screams as he went down. I'm pretty sure the enemy now knows something is up. So I decided I needed to up the game a little bit. Uh, suddenly I see someone's on the mounted gun firing at me. I have been discovered so the stealth plan went right out the window pretty easily so i should probably just go loud at this point i can see figures wandering around in the distance but at this range my pistol isn't going to be too useful they are managing to hit me through these little corrugated iron walls which can't quite stop bullets get a nice kill with a grenade there that grenade will definitely attract some enemy attention now i'm whipping out my light machine gun which i found at the end of the last mission when flora ambushed that convoy they dropped a whole bunch of weapons and one of them was this machine gun so i decided to take it so I'm going to see if it can do some damage. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's pretty much broken. So after firing 20 shots, it jams. I managed to get it back working again. I can see there's a guy sitting in a ditch behind those tires over there. I can't quite tell if I've got him, so I need to go in closer. It's too hard to see in this low visibility. When I get in, I notice he is actually still there. And he can't see me. So I'm going to quickly dispatch him and go into the trench myself. <laughs> making sure he's dead as well. Many times enemies just fall onto the floor but then get back up because they're actually just wounded rather than dead and they come and haunt you once you think they're dead. 
Anyway, so I'm going to move in. There's an empty warehouse, no enemies. I'm still not sure if there are any more hostiles in the area. I'm going to reload just in case. Plus, that means I can use up my reserve ammo and take more ammo from this uh, supply there. So I'm filling up my reserves pretty nicely. Inside, there is an actual cockfighting ring, as the uh, guy at the UFL headquarters described, so I know I'm in the right place. Somewhere back here is where I'm expecting to find the guy I'm supposed to rescue. I figured it's probably inside this building, so I'm going to have a look inside. We can indeed go in. I hear a voice. There is a guy behind this locked door. Let's go and see who it is. Well done, but more guards will be here soon. We will have better luck if we travel separately. Look, my name is Karbani Singh. Thank you for getting me out. I've been your tent. Look for me at my so this fast-talking guy named Singh is uh, not particularly grateful for me saving him. He acted like he was expecting me to show up at any moment. I guess he thinks he's a big shot and that uh, people should come and save him. So he wants to go off on his own, so I'm just going to leave him behind for now. I need to make this escape solo. So I've pretty much completed that mission now. I've gained myself a new buddy as a result, which is always good news. So my next move really is to head back to Parlour, and I guess if the UFLL don't have anything for me to do, I'm going to have to go with APR leads to try and get close to the Jackal, even though I don't particularly like to do their missions. The Sharks operated out of a hotel in the city where the police had a permanent room booking. Nice place actually, I got to stay there a few times, shooting through all the free booze and TV I wanted. Didn't want much half the time though, since I was determined inwardly to remain depressed. The first stage of the plan was to approach the sharks and ask for money. Tony had singled out the location of one of the main contacts of the ring, but wasn't going to do any more work than drive me there. I was the new kid who got to take the risks actually trying to talk some money out of them. Although he was working pretty hard on our fake backstory, perfectly tweaked to get the ring to trust us. We were both some formerly wealthy businessmen, filled with anger and a thirst to regain our power quickly, hinting at there being some people we wanted revenge on. Of course, to sweeten the deal, we were both going to be IRA sympathisers, and if they really pressed our story, we planned to reveal that revenge was not our true motive, but only a cover story for our desires to fund the IRA. It was pretty clear that once we told them that, they would either get the hint and kill us, or open up on the same channel themselves. Tony thought it would be the latter option, and suffice to say, I did not. So, I've made it back to Parla, I'm heading over to the APR headquarters. Something that's interesting to note at this time is that my reputation as a mercenary is growing larger and larger, such that the guys hanging around Parla actually react with fear when I walk past and try to get out of my way, so it's good to show I'm making an impression. So, it's time to give up my weapons and head inside the uh, lavishly furnished APR headquarters to check out the next mission. I'm going to head on upstairs and see what they're talking about today. Hopefully it'll be a little bit more uh, useful to my cause than our last mission. Yeah, sure you do. Look at here, my secret weapon. Good to meet you at last. I've heard a lot about you, and we'd like to talk to you about a job. The UF blah blah is getting a lot of medicine from next door. You know how? By blackmail, that's how. They grab the shipment of something important, fuel or something. But the country next door is desperate, we'll pay anything. You see? Blackmail works. So, I have this idea. You blow up the train, okay? Uh, yes. The uh, rail yard's about one and a half kilometers west of Parlour, right on the edge of the desert. Easy. One move and bam. You're a professional, and you know damn well and good these cars are going to be fortified. I don't suggest hitting them long range. You want to get in there close and plant explosives. Then what's the big fire bad? Can once trains are gone, hey? No more medicine. Too bad. So sad. It's simple, really. Just go to the rail yard and destroy those natural gas cars. So, the APR's plan is to end the blackmail scheme with the UFLL. However, that blackmail scheme is in fact supplying the people with medicine by exploiting people of a neighbouring nation. So, somewhat of a morally ambiguous mission. But for now, I didn't want to take it because I thought on balance, this is a bad idea. I don't really want to end this UFLL deal, especially because it's basically just sticking it to the UFLL for no gain for the APR, so no one's really going to gain in this particular exchange. 
However, as I was leaving, I realized that perhaps my buddies would help me make something a little bit more productive out of this venture. And of course, there's not much else for me to do because the UFLL are away. So if I don't pander to the API, I'm never going to rise up the chain of command. So I accept the mission and I'm just going to go with whatever happens. Smart. This is a classified mission. That means everyone's an enemy, even APR. And they confirmed to me that the APR are going to be hostile to me during this mission, as usual. So I'm still going to have to kill a few APR guys on the way. So hopefully that'll make things a little bit better. So, the first stage of the mission is in theory going to be to go and find this rail yard where the UFLL are holding the supplies that they're blackmailing the neighbouring nation with. Uh, but of course I'm expecting a call from one of my buddies, buddies probably Flora, to uh, see if there's anything better we can do. Let's see what she has to say. I need to speak to you. Meet me east of the rail yard. Well, not much information there, but at least we'll go and see what she has to speak to me about. Perhaps there will be an alternate way of doing this mission that doesn't seem like we're just screwing the UFLL for no particular reason and screwing the people of the nation. The cover story was discussed in detail about a million times. The final time being while I was sat beside Tony in his beat up red car just down the street from our first contact's place of shady business. Tony wished me luck and turned on the radio as I stepped into the street. The destination was an old electronics store that looked like it had been transported wholesale from my childhood. The plastic crap on display was even more yellow than the late 70s manufacturers had intended. Trying not to think about what the hell I was getting myself into, and especially trying not to think about how some part of me would rather be sitting in a cell than doing this, I stepped through the door. Inside it was darker than any legitimate business should be, cluttered with the last 20 years of household appliances. It took about three seconds in that tobacco soaked joint to know that I had a big problem. Across the room from me, behind a counter without an inch of empty space on it, was a woman. I wasn't really the type for speaking to women, and years of macho man soldiering and jail time had cast the opposite sex under such an air of mystery that I didn't even know what language I should speak. But I had to say something, so I said what was on the script burned into my brain by a dozen rehearsals. I told her I was looking for money. That was the opening of a lot of shit, let me tell you. As you might expect, this woman asked me why I wanted money, and why I was coming to an electronics store with such a question. She wasn't such a convincing actor, but for a second I really did think we were barking up the wrong tree. Once a mutual understanding that we were both disinterested in the legality of the issue at hand had been established, she asked why I wanted it. At this point I was keeping to my lines, that I wasn't willing to say why I needed it. All of them were alluring for the implication of underhanded reasoning. Sure enough, it worked. The woman told me her name was Anna. The introduction seemed to break the ice enough for me to actually get a look at her in the gloom. Not bad looking, compared to her surroundings at least. Her voice was the standout feature. She spoke like she was one marriage away from the royal family. I barely knew what she was saying half the time, but she seemed to know what my slang ridden sentences were meant to mean. She beckoned me to the back of the shop and through a mouldy hallway into a storeroom. Just before I entered, Anna leaned in close to me and said that her boss always knew a liar. I nearly turned and ran right then, but it was too late. A suited man who was clearly the source of the tobacco stench was looking at me with a wolfish grin from across the maze of unsold toasters. Anna explained my purpose for being here. The boss man told her to stay, then came over to shake my hand. He didn't waste time pretending he wasn't a loan shark and started asking how much I needed and why. I told him ten grand and it was for a family matter. He laughed and asked me why again. I insisted I'd rather not say anything else, and then did so again when he asked a third time, surprising even myself at my level of ballsiness given the supposed violent streaks of these guys. Plus, it was pretty satisfying screwing with this guy, since I was playing a character. I felt kinda like I could take risks that the real me, if such a guy existed, would not have done. So I've made it to the safe house where Flora's hanging out. There's a bunch of ammo here as a result of recent safe house upgrades. Good news. Let's see what she has to say. Time for work. You're doing something with the APR. Well, I can help you if you help me. There's a cattle ranch. Half a kilometer east of here. There's a front official who lives there. I need you to execute him. There's an entire UFLL platoon sitting on the troop train right now. 
But this fraud at the ranch has ordered them to stand down. He has some side deal going. He intends to rent them out. I need those men to deploy now. The commander of those troops is a high-value target. Ex-Gurka regiment. Total Ardas. I'm going to take that man off the table today. That train's going to derail, and when it does, I'll close in to verify the Gurkha is dead. That means I'll be in the middle of the wreck site when any survivors manage to regroup. I won't be able to get out of there on my own. I'll be surrounded. I need you to rendezvous and give me cover. So Flora has a pretty interesting plan. We're going to kill an official who is preventing UFLL troops from going and protecting the train that we're going to try and blow up because she wants to kill the commander of said troops. So the first stage is taking out an official who for some underhanded reason is forcing the UFLL men to not defend the train, possibly because of some secret self-interest he has in letting the APR plan go ahead. So I need to head over to the train yard and take him out. I'm also stealing this weapon that Flora has, a fairly effective looking assault rifle, though it does look like it's about to fall apart due to rust, but I'm still going to give it a go because it looks like it's more high tier than the previous weapon I had. So let's head over to the train yard and see what we can do about this sneaky official. A silence fell and the boss went back to his desk, sitting down beside a half-eaten meal swimming in grease. He looked at Anna and proclaimed that she was a woman who could judge men well and that she was to state her judgement of me. I looked over at her and she smiled. Walking closer to me, she described me as a warrior, an agent and a master of deceit. Shit. Shit, shit, shit. Right then I was waiting for the boss to repaint his flaking walls with my blood. But somehow, the boss seemed pretty satisfied with that answer. He said that he wanted to know because not everyone was suited to what he referred to as high-pressure debt. In retrospect, I didn't need to be scared at all, since a loan shark can't resist the money, even if his assistant flat out tells him I'm a damned spook. The boss went back to eating, leaving me watching awkwardly. I didn't know what was normal, so I couldn't complain. I noticed Anna was still staring me out. I was pretty freaked, considering that I was 99% sure she knew the deal with me. But even if she did, I would learn later that she wasn't the type to care. So actually, I was perfectly safe, standing there in a time vault of unwanted crap, watching a suspected murderer eat dinner while his pretty assistant stared me out. On balance, one of the less fucked up situations of my life. So now I'm nearing the cattle ranch after clearing out that little inconvenient checkpoint. All I have to do is drive up this road and it's just over the hill on my right. The problem is that as I'm driving I start taking fire from somewhere. It seems that they had some guards posted up on this hill who I'm forced to take out with my assault truck's gun. However, you can see I almost died, so I have to get out. My health is draining. It's just about at zero when I manage to pull this bullet out of my leg, which gives me a bit of health back, and I can use another uh, serrette to get the remainder of my health back. It means I can't take too much damage now that I've used up some of my health supplies. So let's continue with the drive. You can see on the GPS that the cattle ranch is right in front of me, so I need to find a way to get in and assassinate this guy. Now we've actually already been here because I came here to destroy a weapons cache for Flora before. So I already know that there's an overlook on the west side of the ranch where you can see everything below and I could potentially take out enemies. However, the enemies already know I'm here because I've already gunfighted my way into the area. So I take out a couple of them using the mounted gun. I can see more people in the distance over by the buildings. I'm attempting to take them out, clearing some of the trees that are in the way. I'm going to abandon the car for now and go in on foot because the car at the moment is simply a beacon of where I am. I want to try and uh, confuse the enemy a little bit by moving around. They can still see me though. They're firing at me. I'm trying to utilize this new rifle which has a superb sight. It allows me to very accurately fire back at them. So with these, I take down the two guys assaulting me uh, who are nearest to me. Another guy's out there in the grass fields. I miss him with a few shots. He's still firing at me pretty heavily, giving away his position. I'm going to finish him off with the MG because I wanted to save a little bit of ammo for the assault rifle and I've got absolutely loads for this weapon. I had to fire a second burst because it looked like the guy hadn't died properly. So now I need to head over to the building. I see a flare go up which means there's at least one guard left and the flare in the air will attract more guards from nearby guard posts which means it's now in my interest to move quickly. If I can kill the guy and get out before those guards arrive I'm going to avoid a lot of hassle. I fire some shots and I think I take out the guy who fired up the flare. So the only guy left should be my actual target. It looks like he's inside one of the buildings. I'm going to uh, 
sneak in there now and hope there's no one else guarding him. The room on my right is pretty clear, so he's on the room on the left. I spot him there in his suit on the phone as well. He's pretty outraged about my presence. <laughs> Suddenly he pulls out a gun and starts firing at me. I thought there might have been a chance to talk with him there, but it looks like there wasn't. My gun jams at an inconvenient time, but I finish him off with my pistol, so the objective is complete. The death of this man will allow the UFLL to effectively deploy their troops to defend their assets. Nice work with that idiot. Guess you better go start some trouble at the rail yard. <laughs> Flora knew right away that I'd succeeded. I wonder how she knew that. So, as she says, my next objective is going to be to head to this rail yard and actually take out the train. It looks like the reinforcements that whoever fired that flare... Uh, was calling for aren't showing up perhaps because i completed the objective it cancels them showing up but that's good news because it means things are pretty peaceful here for me and i can regain my supplies and get ready for the next part of the mission which we'll be seeing on the next episode of frank's penance